And here we are. All right, everybody, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Pollyanna, our nonprofit, uh, whose mission is to educate and empower communities to honor and protect natural living systems. I'm here with my partner and co-founder and the water witch, Lee Adams. And um, this is our second first Thursday night free first Thursday night of the month free webinars. Uh, we had an idea a long time ago and it's taken a long time to get here to create some free community educational events uh, on um, subjects that are aligned with uh, our, our landscape architecture design firm, Studio Petrichor, and the result, the resulting nonprofit, uh, Pollyanna, which is our in-house, uh, let me let someone in, our in-house nonprofit. Lee, do you want to say something? Uh, just a, a really delightful um, of Andreas to present with us and to be able to share information with the community that we can all use and we can all benefit from. And it's really grateful. I'm grateful for that. And it's a really generous thing. And to see so many people that we know on here is delightful. Yes, and, um, I'm, I can't hear Lee very well, so I don't know if you need to reposition a mic or. Okay, well, I can do. Now she's a podcaster. I can do kindergarten voice if you like. To. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so just very grateful to you for presenting and for the opportunity to share this information with many people that we know and love and people that we don't know yet. And, and love you anyway. And love you anyway, yes. <laughs> Um, and this is then uh, uh, this webinar and this uh, conversation with Andreas and myself has been years in the making, and we're finally <laughs> here. And he started like, let's start off with building one together. And I said, let's do a webinar first, get everybody excited, and then they're gonna it's gonna be like the Hunger Games to get tickets to our <laughs> workshop. So we're gonna we're gonna do this. Let me let someone else in here. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the nonprofit uh, Pollyanna is we create a lot of some events such as this, these free first Thursday night webinars. And um, we, as you, many of you already know, we build Hugel culture, uh, do, doing workshops, building Hugel culture, rainwater harvesting devices and systems. Uh, we have some upcoming events. I'm going to be posting things throughout the evening. I want to do some at the beginning, in the middle and the end. And um, there are more first Thursday night webinars coming up. I'll be posting our website in the chat. And most importantly, with the acknowledgement that this is a free um, to the public event uh, and we are a small and growing nonprofit. And if you feel like you want to donate $5 or $5,000, I'm going to put the link in the chat box. And if you want to donate a little bit of money, we'd really appreciate it. There's no pressure, um, but do it. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, and um I think oh, oh, everybody, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself while the talk is going on. If we hear any background noise, we'll likely mute you. Mute you. We are recording right now. And uh, we did the intro. And uh, we are going to do questions and answers at the end. But if questions come up or you want to chat and say something in the chat box that Andreas will not be looking at, but will be looking at, feel free to use the chat box. I'm not really going to use the question and answers option. But uh, if you if you want to chat directly with me, I'll be watching the, the chat box. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're ready to get started. I'm going to I'm going to add this to the chat box really quickly. So. You can be looking ahead. At who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it. I don't know why it's coming in and out. Andreas. You ready to share? Your, are you ready to share your screen and take it away? Uh, I'm ready to share. Okay. So audio's good. We hear you. Does everybody else hear loud and clear? Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. So my name is Andreas Hessing. Um, I'm a naturalized exotic. And I grew up wandering the, the hills of Southern California, Hacienda Heights. Uh, I've always been fascinated by nature. 
And um, so, you know, all that stuff that we see when we wander in the relatively undisturbed areas is stuff I grew up with and have been fascinated with. And my formal background starts with ceramics back in the 70s and 80s. And um, I was really fascinated by the beauty of form through clay. And then I got into earth art. Here's Alan Sonfist. This is his time landscape uh, on Manhattan um, way back when. And uh, I got interested in architecture and the beauty of space through architecture and um, sculpture. And I was really into Osama Noguchi. So he was um, my first mentor from afar. And um, he was a Japanese American sculptor, designer, stage designer, landscape architect. The guy did amazing amounts of stuff, really prolific. You can still buy his furniture through Herman Miller. And he was good friends with uh, Buckminster Fuller. So here's some lamp, different kinds of lamps he designed. Um, Martha Graham, one of the early um, pioneers of modern dance, he would do the set designs for her. But what really got me was uh, his landscape architecture, um, very sculptural, um, strong forms. And this is probably our closest one down on South Coast Plaza called California Scenario. And uh, in the late eighties, uh, when this opened, I got to go down there and meet him and check this place out. It was pretty cool, pretty magical. Um, and so then I eventually started moving from fired clay objects to earth objects. And I started with, you know, vessel forms and started moving into more architectural forms. And these are all kind of riffs on uh, traditional Japanese tea house windows. So what you're looking at is a, um, a waddle and daub construction. And this is the waddle that they left exposed to create a window. And these are just riffs on that kind of thing. So they started getting more complex. And then they started getting bigger and I started incorporating seeds into them. And always they were about the form and then breaking down and turning into something else. And then that started to change and move into environments. And, um, and I was always fascinated by found materials. So I would collect or make um, parts that didn't, you know, that I didn't have already and cobble them together to make the different things. Um, this was a bunch of objects that I pulled out of a river cleanup, turned into a fountain. And since 91, I've been basically doing um, uh, architectural and environmental installations that um, focus on uh, regional land use issues and in particular water. And so th this was my first attempt at uh, handmade architecture and, and earth walls, and uh, it failed. And so uh, the walls in the back here are all paper, but the walls in the front here were originally all soil. But when I took the forms off, they all slumped to the ground. And because I had to meet my exhibition date, I had to quickly change it out and do something else. So, um, and then some of this is, uh, this was for the um, Santa Fe Art Colony. I applied for that. Obviously I didn't um, get chosen if any of you ever saw what was done, but this was my proposal for that. And I collaborated with other people. This was a collaboration with Karen Bonfili under the foundation of the brewery. And we basically created this kind of temple-like atmosphere, um, created two 50 foot long pools of water. And then on the benches are these boat forms filled with living plants at the front where the sunlight reaches. And then as you move backwards into the space, they become much more skeletal. And the idea is if you kept going and down that hallway, you'd have to leave your body behind to go through this uh, 
um, gold leaf doorway. Uh, another collaboration with Karen Bonfili. This was at the Armory in Pasadena. Just talking about the ridiculous way we treat the environment and lawns and water and stuff here. And there's a little topo map embedded in the top of the table there. A little ephedra for this place setting. And then the rest of these are all um, smaller scale things that um, um, all incorporate moving water. Here we have a map of California carved into the drywall. Uh, the tea ball waters the rushes. And um, spherical ice balls were put on top of the augers to water the plants down below. And then some larger scale environments. This was uh, the first annual Arroyo Fest. And this was a, a water cleanup proposal that I did with the artist, Catherine Miller. And um, so there's a series of arcs here. The one in, in the foreground, you can't really see. There's an arc here that stops the floating trash. There's an arc with limestone that neutralizes heavy metals. And then three more that um, um, have water, um, water plants in them whose root zones create the habitat for the microorganisms that actually clean the water. And this was a really fun project. And um, one of the other cool things was they closed off the 110 freeway and you could ride your bike on it. So it would be nice to recycle that again someday if we could. Uh, a piece that was done in Hahamunga about transpiration. And so there's a little tag here that talked about transpiration and had this um, image of stomata and stuff. And then you'd pull that string and it would dump water on you. And then getting into larger scale um, public art projects. So this is a project up in the hills above Whittier, the outdoor classroom that um, we'll see more images on. And all of those efforts um, led to my landscape design and build practice, Scrub J. And this is that same garden you just saw. Uh, and this is a series of terraces that we created um, from the soil on the site. And it was rammed, sort of. And there was a tiny amount of Portland cement in it. Um, but it enabled us to create these terraces that would last for a decade or so and then slowly lose their hard edges and start to break down. And it was all focused around this tree that fell over. And then, of course, all the wildflowers were first. And there's this lovely Ariagana mole here that uh, lasted for a number of years and then just suddenly died. And it was replaced with... Uh, Salvia Desperado. And that's basically what the garden looks like today. So that's who I am. That's where I come from. Andreas, I know I'm breaking the cardinal rule of asking questions too early. Can you remind <laughs> me of what street that was on? Because anybody could drive by and see that, right? That's on Eldora Road. Eldoro? Eldora. 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 And so um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about some history of alternative, so-called alternative building and to kind of you know, anchor where Ram Earth is in this. So um, many of the techniques that we talk about these days of alternative building are just traditional ways of building that have been around for centuries, if not thousands of years. So, and there, you know, people and cultures all over the world have figured this stuff out. It's, it's nothing new, whether it's, you know, a Saudi half buried in the ground or something made out of woven bamboo or originally animal skins, you know, simple everyday materials that people always used everywhere in the world and still use everywhere in the world. And then all changed once we started depending on fossil fuels, of course, and we had opportunities to use other materials and to not pay attention to the environment. So this is Long Beach. 
back in the day. They're moving that house out of there so they put more derricks in. So when it comes to earth building, A is for Adobe. And here's a lovely uh, oven right here in the foreground. Uh, here's a contemporary Adobe down in San Marcos, Northern San Diego County, uh, made from soil on the site by the homeowner. And this, we're um, looking basically from the uh, southeast. This, so this is the southern face of the building. But you can see how big these eaves are. There's no shadow. And this photo was taken in August. Um, there's no shadow on the wall. I mean, there's no light on the wall. So it's really protected from the sun. And then they've got this beautiful Quercus agrifolia on the Western exposure. And like somebody said earlier before we started, um, when you go inside this building, it's mid 60s and it doesn't matter what time of year it is, whether it's cold or hot outside, it's really lovely inside, very pleasant. So Adobe. Uh, B is for straw bale. Um, and here's a straw bale building under construction. And it looks like they're starting to um, do an earth plaster on it. Uh, here's one with a living roof. Uh, C is for uh, cob. Cob is basically um, a partial clay soil that's got a bunch of straw and organics mixed into it that kind of helps to bind it, kind of like tiny little flexible pieces of rebar. And it's built in courses, just as rammed earth is. So here's the first course below it. Here's the fresh course that was just laid. And as soon as it gets to a certain stiffness, then it'll be shaved. And you can see this guy is shaving, you know, with an old saw blade. And cob is uh, usually plastered and or whitewashed afterwards to give it a waterproof skin. And then D is for wattle and daub. Um, wattle and daub structures are basically wooden structures. All the structural material is all made of wood. And then the infill panels are, in this case, bamboo, but they can be sticks. And then they're plastered. And this is the basic model that we use for stick and stucco today. It's just the old way of doing it. And this is what you see uh, when you think of traditional Japanese buildings or the half timbered buildings that we think of in medieval Europe. That's all wattle and daub construction. And if you're going to do this earth building on a larger scale, you need more equipment. And so this is a project that was done by the Claremont Environmental Design Group um, out by. Um, California Botanic Garden, but this was back when it was Rasbag. And this is the parent soil in the back here. And you can see there's all kinds of big cobbles and boulders in it. And it's being sifted with the help of the tractor and this man's back um, into its, the parts that they're gonna be useful for them. And then they mixed it with 20% Portland cement and they made a super adobe building. So basically they're pumping these long nylon bags full of this mixture uh, and stacking them one on top of the other. And then they cast this lovely arched roof on it. And then you can see here, they're starting to, you know, where they need to dig channels or just lay in the gaps in between all the utilities. And then the whole thing is plastered over. And like much earth building, the walls are pretty thick which provides a lot of thermal mass, which makes it very comfortable to be inside, whether it's warm or cold outside. And it, you know, nice soft edges. Um, this is almost finished. You can see just this, this um, ventilation chimney here is the last part that needs to be done. And then that's basically what it looks like now. So they have this lovely drought tolerant garden. It looks like there's some natives in there. Um, and if anybody has any information about Claremont Environmental Design Group, I'd love to get a hold of them again. Um, I cannot find a website or a direct way to get all I just see Yelp and LinkedIn and all that other garbage, uh, but I'd love to talk to them again. 
Um, and at this point, I'd like to um, take a little break and just say um, that I owe a lot of my basic understanding to um, the late David Easton. Uh, he was an engineer and uh, he wrote this book called The Rammed Earth House. And if you're gonna, I would say, if you're gonna get one source that's gonna give you information on rammed earth from beginning to end, this is a great source. Um, there's a lot of information in here and some of it is fairly technical, but he'll take you through the entire process. And his, um, one of his um, legacies is the company that he founded, Rammed Earthworks. And he was an experimenter. He tried a lot of different ways of doing rammed earth and then kind of tweaking it and um, doing different variations on it to the point where now they're actually making these freestanding, very narrow rammed earth panels that they can make in their factory and then ship them to a location, install them on site um, and they're not the structural part of the building anymore. They're just this beautiful facade that they can do anything with. And then an outgrowth of that was uh, another company called Watershed Materials. And they came up with um, uh, a way of creating a new um, block press that put huge amounts of pressure and they could create, um, for lack of a better term, EMUs earth masonry units um, that rival the CMUs that we see everywhere and they uh, meet ASTM standards and there's no Portland cement in them at all. They, they were able to formulate things so that they could make these beautiful blocks out of just earth. Um, so check out those two places and now we move on to history. So, Rammed earth is a really ancient building method, thousands of years old. And like I said before, cultures all around the world have figured this out. Um, this is a part of the Great Wall of China, supposedly a section that has never been um, restored. And you can see the telltale horizontal bands of rammed earth as it slowly weathers. Uh, and um, also in China, they have these, um, these big clan housing developments. So, Probably mom and dad lived here, and then the children built this one, and the grandchildren, and etc. And these are huge structures. And you can see they have these huge overhanging eaves to protect the soil from weathering and also, you know, allow you to walk out of the rain when it's heavily raining. And, and for me, one of the most fascinating things is just whoopsie, come back. Um, is how the material weathers. And so since these buildings are gonna last for centuries, as they slowly weather, they just become these giant rock faces, right? So here's an old, um, old building in France. They did a lot of rammed earth in France over the centuries. Some of those old chateaus are there. Um, here's a bad fuzzy photo of a contemporary building in France. And again, you can see those um, telltale horizontal bands of the signature of rammed earth. But this has been done everywhere in the world. So, you know, every culture who's decided to big, make earth has figured out one way or another to do this. So, and look at all that beautiful detailing at the top. And um, the great mosque in Mali. So, there's your little history lesson. So we're going to move on to forming. So this was my first successful earth wall. And I built this uh, in a garden in Whittier. And it's kind of a, a, a Frankenstein waddle and daub and, um, and puddled mud. So basically, I made a skeleton of of reed fencing and sticks and stuff like that in between all the, the wood framing. And then I put some plywood forms up and then I just mixed up my mud and I dumped it in there with five gallon buckets. And because I was gun shy after my first walls failing, 
On this one, I left those forms on for probably six weeks and I would carefully like peek under there every couple of weeks to see was it dry. And once it was, I ended up with this lovely earthen wall. It looks like some old ruin in, in somebody's garden. And so from here forward, I'm gonna show you a, a series of humble, low little terraces and walls, um, partially because I have yet to make a building, but also um, I think they show the process nicely. So this was a garden that I did in North Hollywood. Uh, we poured the concrete walkway with these nice sharp corners and then made it the, the terraces to those steps, kind of like the earlier garden you saw in Pasadena. And when it's this scale, you can use the traditional forming methods that you would use for pouring concrete. So in this case, two by sixes suspended on steel stakes and um, you know, backed up with a lot of kickers and stuff and a very tiny amount of Portland cement mixed in with the native soil, which is, um, was sufficient to get what we needed. And um, both that garden and this garden, um, these little terraces um, were meant to fall, to break down over time. So this is um, a very tiny garden in a front yard um, with the largest manzanita in captivity. And you can see the telltale horizontal bands. And then we also did some other mixtures so we got different colors. But basically rammed earth, um, the form work is just a pair of boards or some logs um, that are held in place so that they can't spread apart. And you fill it with soil and you smash it down so that it becomes kind of like sedimentary rock. And uh, you'll forgive me while I uh, consult my script here a little bit. Um, this is traditional rammed earth um, forming, form work. And so again, you've got boards on either side. Um, this is gonna be the thickness of your wall. And all the vertical boards are meant to keep the forms from deflecting or bending. And all the horizontal boards are meant to keep the forms from spreading apart. So you have a consistent thickness. And after you get done ramming all of this, these bottom ones here are gonna be surrounded by your material and are gonna be embedded in the, in the rammed earth. And you can remove them or you can leave them in place as we saw earlier. And sometimes they're left in place for um, visual reasons. And sometimes they're left in place because they can form a ladder or a scaffolding if you need to do um, uh, repeated maintenance. Like this is uh, continually skinned um, with a new mud on the outside to, to keep it waterproof. But basically the way you make a rammed earth wall is you take your formwork and you make a course that's as high, you fill it up to the top of your formwork and then you move it along and you go around the perimeter of the building or whatever your structure is. And when you get done with that, then you move the formwork up and you do another course and you do another course until you get to the top of your wall, whatever that is. And so on this one, you can see that um, instead of having these big boards that are embedded in the wall, um, they're using, uh, looks like all thread or something here and some little bolts. So when they unbolt this, they can take their formwork off and move it down and make some more. But also because they're not ramming to the full height of the wall at one time, they're ending up with a cold seam. And so this is the cold seam, the joint between one course of earth and the next. And so you can see the, the builder here has um, stuck all these rocks on it and little pieces of rebar or metal rod or something so that there's a tooth that the next course can bite onto. So if there's any earth movement or movement of, of the building for whatever reason, you know, the bottom course is not gonna move independently of the top one. They're, they're kind of, there's enough friction, they'll stay together. And so here's an example of that. So this whole bottom area here was rammed up long ago and it looks like they plastered it. And this looks like a repair. And then they've moved their formwork up and this one is just finished and now they're gonna work on this corner, side of the corner. 
but you can see the old boards that are left embedded in the wall here. And whether they take those out or not, I don't know. But you can see when they built this, because this looks like a repair. You can, I mean, and look at how thick that wall is above this guy's head. Here's holes where the form boards that were embedded were either removed or they broke down or whatever. And um, a la Mr. Easton, um, I followed his directions. And instead of using traditional form work like you saw earlier, we're using plywood as the basic skin. And they're backing it up with two by fours, two by sixes, whatever is needed. And um, here we're making form work for a bench that you see in the background. Um, but then we're using pipe clamps that run through the form work as a way of clamping them together. And then they also hold the two end boards in place. And in order to keep these forms from deflecting, um, we have these whalers, these boards here. And these boards are really useful, especially if you're making a, a very tall wall here, a couple of stories or something. They become a ladder and they also become a work platform that you can stand on while you're working. And then there's a lot of details in this stuff. And I don't have time to go into all the details tonight, but one of the ones you can see here is this chamfer strip. It's a little three quarter inch, um, 45 degree chamfer strip. And, and it's around all edges. And you can see we put some two by material on here so that when we're ramming, we don't accidentally hit our strip and destroy it. And in this case, if you're gonna make voids, so we were making a bench, so we have a seat in the back, you ram up to the top of the seat, you put a box in, and then you ram up to the back. And uh, obviously this box is not the one that was used because it's much smaller than the finished thing. But here's the real thing. So this is that same form work in place while we were building. Here's the box that's taking up that space for the seat. And here's the top of the back. And you can see the pipe clamps going through. Um, and then there's uh, these really important little wedges here. And they keep the pipe clamps from getting uh, deflected and getting trapped so that you can take your um, end boards off when you take all of this apart. Um, and then once you're done, you take the forms off and it's done. You don't have to plaster it. You don't have to paint it. You don't have to do anything. The, the, the structure is complete. And rammed earth is very strong. And as soon as the forms come off, you can start loading it with weight. So let's look at a couple of details here. Uh, and one of those is this little lip at the bottom. Right, so this is a quarter inch, I mean a three quarter inch thick lip. And this receives the three quarter inch plywood that is our form material. And so it can rest on top of this lip so that it doesn't slide down. And then it can, we can clamp against the face here so that um, when you're ramming the material, it can't get between your foundation and your board and start to change the form of it. So that, these little details like this are really important. And then the other thing you can see in this image is that we tried two different ways of ramming, um, two different tools um, when we did this. So we rammed from the foundation to the seat level with pneumatic rammers, and we rammed from the seat level up to the back with hand rammers. And it's obvious that when, you're, when we use the pneumatic rammers, um, we get less of that banding and where we use the hand rammers, you can see those horizontal layers much clearer. And then there's those chamfer strips that created these beveled edges around all the corners. And that's, again, here's that lip. Those chamfered uh, edges are really important so that you don't have sharp corners that are gonna break off um, when you take the formwork off or when it's being lived with or whatever and, and a potentially crack out a big chunk and, you know, or, you know, if you run into it with your hip, it doesn't hurt like hell. So all those little things become important. And then in this one, since this was a test, um, we started experimenting with different kinds of sands and embedding seashells and attacking it with a hammer and chisel right after taking off the formwork to see what we could do with textures. 
And this is, uh, that was a test for this amphitheater that's built uh, in the hills above Whittier. And so here's our little um, omega shape chalked out on the ground. And after our um, foundation was poured and we're taking the form work off the foundations. And again, there's some details in here that are very important. So here's our little lip again to put our, and it runs all the way around all sides of this formwork. I mean, this uh, foundation. And then there's this keyway that runs through the center. And you can see we've taken out the, the boards all the way up to this point in this photo. And this allows us to lock the round earth into the foundation so it cannot move away from it. It can't, you know, if there's an earthquake or anything, this thing will just sit there and not go anywhere. And this is a deceptive perspective here because the distance from here to here is actually three feet. This is 18 inches wide here. And there's your finished wall. And this is meant as an outdoor classroom um, at the trailhead and the, up in the Whittier Hills. And you can see our banding um, areas where we, you know, change the formulation um, to get, you know, kind of that, that sedimentary look. Um, but one of the things that's, if you look carefully, you'll see that this block here, and this block here, don't have holes in it where the pipe clamps go through. So here you can see the holes where the pipe clamps go through, and you can see the same on this one. And this one, they were um, uh, filled up already. So you take the same mixture we were using to make the big blocks, and then we use dowels and things after we take the pipes out and fill those holes. But this was made by making this block, and then this one, and then this one, and this one, and that one. And then we came out back and filled in the spaces in between. In the original blocks, we could run the pipe clamps outside of the formwork and not penetrate the block. But after that, because we're filling in the space, now we have to penetrate the block. So now the pipe clamps have to go through the blocks themselves. All right, so, and then it was waterproofed. Uh, and this was, we were working with the city of Whittier and they were, um, they were very afraid of rammed earth. They knew nothing about it. Um, they, they made us take, jump through all kinds of hoops. Um, but one of the ones that we were gonna do anyway is waterproofing. So this is our waterproofing membrane painted on the outside. And see, we carefully um, extended past the seam of the foundation. So um, no water can penetrate between the foundation and the rammed earth. And then just to be super extra careful, we squirted a little Henry's wherever a pipe went through the formwork. And then we had to spray a graffiti coating, a clear coating on the outside. And then we backfilled. And then we planted. And then that's our, our finished little amphitheater there. And uh, these guys are continuing, uh, this is all a restoration planting. So plants were um, um, cuttings and seed were collected within a radius of the space and then uh, grown out and then planted in here. And so the ranger can stand here and talk in a normal voice and explain what they're gonna do on the hike, where they're gonna go, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then they can walk around the outside here and they can look at the different plants and he could say, well, here's Mimulus. Um, this is, you're gonna see this growing on the east and north slopes. Here's Artemisia Californica. You're gonna see this growing in the full sun. Here's Laurel Sumac, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this holds about uh, 50 adults, excuse me, or a hundred children. And uh, one of the fun things we discovered after building it is you can stand here and talk in a normal voice and your echo will come back to you from this form. So that was fun. And we embedded shells in it um, and changed the texture a little. We, we took, took away some of the um, smooth surface and just kind of did a little exposing of some of the selected shell stuff. And then you can see some of the color changing here from the iron oxide and stuff we added to the mix at certain points. 
Um, a wall that was built for um, California Botanic Garden or RASBAG before to uh, house cliff dwelling plants. So, and you can see this is pretty early on. So the, the colored portions are pretty garish still, but we embedded rocks in it, created voids to plant the plants in. There's one of those gorgeous Ariagonum ovalifoliums growing out of that little crack there. And so now we're gonna move on to another project. And like the previous one, starting with your foundation, and in this case, again, it's concrete, but traditionally rammed earth is not done with concrete foundations because you know, up until we get to about Roman times, um, people didn't make concrete. Um, often rammed earth buildings were just built you know, below grade. Um, sometimes they made um, rock or rubble foundations and built on top of it, and they still survived just fine. Um, so this was a public art project at Vasquez Rocks that I did with uh, materials and applications, um, Jenna and Oliver at that time. And um, so we don't have a lip here to clamp against. So we had to do a little um, thought. And so here was our cheesy little um, conceptual model of how the form work is gonna go. Um, and I particularly like the little cardboard wedges. Those are fun. And so um, we added stainless steel studs. We drilled and epoxied them in so we could clamp our formwork to the outside of the foundation. And then we started building our formwork. And uh, we build it, clamp it up, um, put the nuts and bolts on and washers on. And there's our completed box. And in this case, um, because it's so broad, and um, it, once we put um, the pipe clamps on here, it's gonna start to tweak things. We put these spacers in just to hold it apart and to keep the, the walls plumb. And then we put in our pipe clamps and put all our flags on because this is a, a, an official construction site with permitted contractors and inspectors and all of the above. And we had to put, whoops, sorry about that. We had to put um, uh, this diagonal bracing in to, to keep these um, whalers up in the air because there's gonna be a lot of people swarming over this. Uh, most of them are not contractors because this was a community project. And that's your form work, right? So different kinds of form work. We're gonna move on now to soils. And I know this is a little backwards. Usually uh, you talk about the soils first, but you know, that's the way we're doing it. So this is the town of Hinckley. Um, and one of the things the folks in Hinckley did before they were forced out was they raised chickens. And here's the chicken coops made from their soil. Uh, and they've been exposed to the elements for decades. And so you can see these walls are starting to melt and they're just gorgeous, just even melting because they lost their roofs long ago. But you can see there was no Portland cement used in this, just like most traditional rammed earth has no cement in it. And you can see exactly what it's made of. And so to quote um, Mr. Easton, to be compacted into a strong and durable rammed earth wall, a soil should be well graded blend of different sized particles. Large sand and small gravel provide the bulk of the matrix. Smaller sand particles and silt fill the voids. Clay provides the glue. And so that's what we're looking at. So here's our small gravel. Here's our large sand. And then the smaller gravel and the silt is filling all the spaces in between. And then here's our clay, right? And so um, you can see on the bottom of this piece of gravel that's been exposed here, there's this kind of scummy skin on it. And over here, you can see it's cr actually cracked, but the clay itself becomes a colloid 
because of the small amount of water you add to it and the ramming process itself. And what it does is just by doing that, um, it surrounds every particle with this thin film of clay and that's what cements everything together. So the compaction process and the clay together are what cements the rammed earth wall into a nice solid stable mass. And you can see here they embedded wire in it and there's even a bigger rock. It's probably about the size of your fist. But you know, even as it breaks down, it's just this beautiful stuff. It's just, it's the earth itself. So if your soils look like this and they produce crops like this, that's not a good soil to build with. No organics allowed. But if your soil looks like this, then you can turn it into something that approaches the parent rock. And so here's your basic formula. <coughs> Excuse me. So 70% sand and gravel, 30% clay and silt. And so what that tells us is that just about the maximum amount of clay you want is 15%. And actually a little less is better. If you have too much clay, it's gonna absorb and release water and that wall is gonna expand and contract and eventually tear itself apart. And so the earth builders around the world long ago figured out, and then the more recent ones like Easton and, and many of the other people who started the revival here in the United States back in the 70s, um, examined walls all around the world. And this is the basic formula for successful, stable, long lasting rammed earth walls. Now there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's your basics. So if we look at the particles that make up that wall or that structure, and we scale them up to make it something that's you know understandable. If a grain of sand is the size of a barrel or a 55 gallon drum, then a grain of silt is the size of a dinner plate and a particle of clay is the size of a coin. And on the other end of that, the large gravel is gonna be the size of an automobile. So the clay is so tiny that it can surround everything easily when it's in a colloid state. And remember clay particles are little plates. They're like little square plates and they're stacked up next to each other and they have an electrical charge. So they can actually chemically bond to other materials. Whereas none of these other things have an electrical charge. That's also why pottery can work the way it does. So the first thing we wanna do is get a sample of our soil. And in this case, we already did a basic jar test, filling up the soil, uh, filling up a mason jar with three quarters of soil and adding water and then letting it sit to see if we get any sedimentary layers. And that and some other basic field tests tell us that it looks like the soil might be suitable. So then we start doing some other basic testing. So, Here's all our test blocks lined up here, and there's some more behind there, and some screens, and our wheelbarrows, etc. And so we're going to start taking this pile of soil, and we're going to break it down by sifting it through one size screen, and then a finer screen, and finer screens, until we break it into its constituent parts. So this is our largest gravel, probably a little too big for our wall. And the next size down, it's a maybe. This is definitely a good size. And here's our large sand. And the last pile we end up with is clay and silt. And we don't really know yet how much clay and how much silt. And so again, there are various simple field tests that you can do to start to get a closer idea of what that is. And so one of them is to make little cookies out of it. And then you touch them to your tongue and if it sticks to your tongue, you know there's a fair amount of clay in it. And um, 
I don't show you pictures of the other tests because this is the most fun picture. And now that we know that, yeah, we know something more about the soil, we start to ram test blocks. So we can do it with pieces of wood and hammers. We can use our hand rammers. And here's our finished test blocks. And after they've cured for a little bit in the forms, we take them out and now we can start to see what's going on with them. Did we change the formulation? How does this layer look compared to this one? Does it crack easily? Um, what's the color like? Um, all that kind of stuff. And as the material dries out, it becomes harder. And then um, sitting here, cutting up our stainless steel bolt heads off to make our studs for the foundation was my, um, my lead man for this project, Ruben Antonio. And here's some color tests. This was actually for that um, rammed earth amphitheater, but there are um, a whole bunch of different colors of, um, what do you call it? Um, iron oxides that you can add that are meant to be added to concrete to color it. And then also chemicals that uh, we can borrow from ceramics production to color things. And in this case, um, we were trying to match this piece of rock. So um, obviously our red was a little too garish and this one was a little too orange and this one is pretty close and that one's pretty close. And so that's your little soil section. And then finally we get to ramming. So you can use hand rammers. These are some stainless steel hand rammers I had welded up for me and they'll last for many generations. But you could also use pneumatic rammers. And so here's a bunch of guys uh, on form work that's full height. So this is the full height of a wall. This is a building under construction. And you can see um, at the end of their hoses are pneumatic rammers. And so when you're ramming a structure or a wall, you do it in lifts. So each layer is called a lift. You're gonna add six, eight inches of soil in. You're gonna compact it until it's the appropriate compaction. And then you're gonna add another lift, compact it, add another lift. And then you just keep doing that until you get to the top of your wall. The very top of the wall, generally you want a finished surface. So whether you're gonna put floor joists on here and make a, you know, make a second floor or put rafters or whatever you're gonna do up here, usually you wanna finish surface on the top. And so that takes a little extra work. Every layer below it, particularly the first one, is getting a surcharge from every layer you've rammed above it, but this one doesn't. So you have to spend a little more time on the last one. And then you take your formwork off and your wall is done. And you can start loading it with weight immediately. So this is the ramming process for that Vasquez Rocks project. And so uh, here's Ruben um, running the rototiller. And we're using a rototiller as a mixer because we want to mix all the particles together with the small amount of water we use very thoroughly. And if you use a cement mixer, um, what happens is it, um, the water doesn't get distributed evenly and you end up with a weaker wall. Um, if you add Portland cement to it, you'll find that the Portland cement surrounds a particle or a small group of particles and makes little balls. And so your finished wall ends up looking like styrofoam. So because it has cement in it, it's strong enough that it's not gonna come apart, but it doesn't develop the kind of strength that a rammed earth wall would develop without Portland cement if you mixed it better. So the mixing part is super important and usually the bottleneck on your ramming process. So we have our pile of material, we spray it with some water, we run the rototiller through it a few times, and then there's a bunch of guys around the outside and they're just pulling the material back into the center. So you can take some more passes, spray some more water and really thoroughly mix all this stuff together. So this is very similar to uh, making a pastry. 
just on a large scale. So the rototiller is more like using a fork or a pastry knife to blend the butter into the flour mixture rather than trying to put it into a, you know, a, a bowl mixer or something like that. So very effective for these smaller scale projects. Then you deliver that mix to the formwork. And you can see rammed earth is a pretty physical process. It's very satisfying, but you know, you're gonna get a workout. And then because we're dealing with a community project, there's a lot of people involved that were not builders. And even those that were probably didn't know rammed earth. We had to put in these markers here that said, you know, fill up to the line and then the rammers can go to work. And so these three are making their second pass around the material. And you can see it creates this trough here when the material is really soft, when you first throw it in, um, when you hit it with the rammer, it, it, you know, it smashes down pretty quickly. So you make a very methodical circuit all the way around. Then you do another one all the way around. You keep doing these concentric rings until you've finished in the middle and then you start on the outside again and you keep doing that until it's rammed to the appropriate density. And that appropriate density, you have to learn. So if you've never done it before, you need to practice or you need someone who knows how to tell you, you know, how to do it, when to stop. And so we keep adding uh, lifts. And you can see here at this point, this layer, this lift has been rammed enough that when they hit it, it doesn't make very deep of a trough anymore. And the nice thing about the hand rammers is that they're heavy enough that if you just lift it up and let the weight of the rammer do the work, you don't have to use a lot of muscle. It takes a good grip, but you don't have to be super strong. You just have to be able to do it over and over. And so this is the finished point of one lift. And you can see the dents in the ground. So this is the outline of that square pad on the bottom of the rammer. And you can see it's, it's a little rough. And in this case, um, the different layers were meant to break down at different time periods. And people were um, uh, embedding objects in it. And so for some, it was a celebration. For some, it was a memorial. And all this stuff was, all these objects were dropped in at various points in time and then ramped. So here we're getting close to the top of the formwork. And you can see, you know, it's a relatively rough surface, but it's not complete yet. And at the very end, to give ourselves a finished surface and to give a little bit more oomph to that top layer, we use these blocks and hammers. And the blocks are just continually moving while you tap, tap, tap with your hammer. And you get out all the imperfections in the surface and you make sure you compact that top surface. So you can see that it's hard enough now that we can walk on there with our bodies and not leave impressions in the, in the, in the mix here. And then you take the forms off and you're done. Um, and here we are um, cutting off all these um, uh, stainless steel <laughs> studs. Fergus, can you take care of him? And then over time, it starts to break down and the plants start growing. And uh, the material we ran starts to resemble uh, the native rock in the area. And when this finally breaks down all the way, what will be left is this concrete foundation. And then there's actually a bronze sculpture that's bolted to it that's underneath all these layers that we don't know what it is yet. And the final project I'm gonna show you is um, a project that was done in the Hollywood Hills up near the sign. And um, this was a, a, a completed patio space. And so, you know, here's all our prep work covering it with ram board and, and a door skin and whatever to protect it and getting all the materials and prepping it. And this string line here is the back of where our wall is gonna be. And so in this project, we're gonna do a kind of a combination of 
uh, building, making blocks out of ram soil. Um, and we did this because there was no way to get a tractor onto the site and we didn't wanna take material off the site. So we wanted to use the soil on the site to make our retaining walls. So first thing we did was cut the toe of the hill off so we could fit our gabion baskets in. And you can see the organic layer, this O layer here is, is only three to four inches thick. And then below that, the parent material is all basically DG. So, um, which is a great material to do ramming with just in its natural state. And so, uh, because ours is gonna be below grade and act as a retaining wall, we did add some Portland cement to it. And then we rammed up these um, forms here and then cracked each one in half and cured them. And then stack them in our cages. And there's our finished wall. Took all the protection off the fountain and everything else. And we planted the garden. And then it grew into this lovely little space. And so part of the program of this was um, the, uh, the owner wanted us to riff off this little broken concrete retaining wall he had made over here. And so that's why we came up with this solution. And it was a really nice space to be in. I think Sean saw this once. I actually did some work at the garden just on the other side of that fence. And Tom, this is just down the street from the client's at the top of Beachwood Canyon that we worked on together. And this client ended up selling this house and got a new mid-century modern that I'm now um, engaged in working on their garden. Sweet. So um, that's the end of the presentation here. And um, I thank you for uh, putting up with me. Um, could I stop the share or what do you want to do? Yeah, stop the share and um, uh, let's see, how do you, you celebrate? and uh, clap our hands and thank you yeah. so much for that. Um, here we go, I'm gonna do it, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Someone wants to know somebody's opinion on Michael Heiser's new uh, piece that was just unveiled in, out in Nevada, that's funny. What do you know about that? Oh, I, you know, just what everybody else knows. It's been in production for what, 40 years now? <coughs> and, uh, you know, it's his, it's, his, uh, it's his version of pyramids and, and yeah. huge scale earthworks. Um, love to see it. Um, I know there's uh, lots of people who feel like, you know, it's a waste of time and a horrible environmental degradation. And, and it might be those things. I haven't been there, so I don't know. Um, but, you know. He wants to be like the kings of old and build giant structures. Uh -huh. Well, Andreas, uh, this this is, uh, I mean, I've been curious about this for years. And like I said, it's been, it's taken us this long to get together and we live right around the corner from one another. <laughs> so I think it's time we start hanging out no matter what, let's right? start hanging out. I agree. And going on hikes and, and doing some plant nerding stuff together. Um, I'd like to open up the, the floor to, uh, asking questions. I know that there must be a lot ruminating in your heads. I did add um, Andreas's website and uh, email address here if you want to reach out to him directly. And uh, I also added uh, Pollyanna's uh, information as well, just in case you missed it earlier. Um, we are uh, uh, accepting donations for more events like this to fundraise to uh, create more accessible, approachable uh, educational workshops for communities. So, um, and please know that by clicking on you know, any of these, you can copy and paste the donate, but down at the bottom there are more upcoming events and there are a lot of good ones coming up and we have a few, uh, we've got more coming uh, in the winter. So um, with that said, I'd love to open up the floor for questions. Uh, I suppose you could either raise your hand or just unmute and ask questions. <laughs> Oh, I love seeing all these familiar names. Well, if no one's going to jump to it, I have a question. <laughs> Do okay. you always use a concrete foundation? 
Um, you don't have to. Um, those smaller terraces and stuff, none of those had foundations. Yeah. And traditional rammed earth, you know, that's been done over the centuries, mostly doesn't have a foundation. Yeah. But um, sometimes they do have rubble foundations or rock or things like that. Okay. But many of them are just um, the wall itself goes below grade and they seem to hold up. So, All right. um, so in getting that perfect recipe, that perfect well-graded mix of 70% sand and gravel and 30% clay and silt, um, you mentioned earlier the jar test. Is that your way of, of testing it? Or well, do, you, do you ever yeah, send it in to like Wallace Labs and does that tell you anything? Well, um, you start out with field tests like the jar test and you, and you get some basic information about, you know, is this useful at all? in the beginning. And, and so you go through a number of those simple field tests. And then if you wanna go further, if you're actually gonna build a building or something that requires you know, a structure that um, you have to depend upon, especially if you're gonna you know, get permits and okays by municipal authorities, then you take your material to labs and you do compression tests and all those other kinds of things. But you don't start there. You start with a simple, I can do it on my own thing. And that gives you a lot of information. So for instance, um, it'll tell you right away, is there organics in my soil? Because it'll float to the top of the water and then you'll know. Um, and just things like that. So awesome. Does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have a question? Because I know I have another one. I do too. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to know if you've taken part uh, in of any of the testing that's been done at Quail Springs through the Permaculture Institute there. No, I haven't. Okay. So are, what are they building there? Uh, mostly cob, but there's also rammed earth. Okay. And, um, just doing um, all kinds of tests on strength tests resistance, uh, right. fire, et cetera. Right. Yeah, I'd love to take a field trip out there, but I haven't been there yet. Oh, yeah, I think you would enjoy that. Also, um, Cal Earth. Right. Not, sorry, not Cal Earth. Um, Cal, yes, Cal Earth, Nader Khalili's work. Yeah, I did a workshop with him when I was in school years ago. Yeah. On, uh, yeah, those, those are fascinating, a, a little different. But, um, but yes, also earth building. Yeah, I, I had a commission on his um, house up at the Institute uh, uh -huh. do, help, doing the glass work for his house. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat box by Laura. Hi, Laura, lovely to see you. Um, awesome talk, two questions. Uh, one, how often do you use earth not from the site itself? Let's answer that first. Um, well, it you're gonna do a you know it, wherever you feel like you want to build something. The first thing you're gonna do is do some of those basic field tests and see if your soil is suitable at all. Um, and um, so, uh, a number of the things I've done were not suitable, and so. Um, uh, particularly that um, rammed earth amphitheater in Whittier, the, the, the city was so paranoid that uh, I had to make sure that we would use something that um, was gonna work the first time. And so we just um, imported DG. And uh, DG already has that blend of particles if it's, if it's decent DG and no organics. And um, it works great on its own. So um, how often, you know, every site is different. Um, and then as far as permits for rammed earth, um, uh, California does have, because of people like Easton and some of the other early, early pioneers, and I say early because, you know, 1970s, even though people have been doing it for centuries, um, uh, they helped to write um, the, the code for rammed earth and earth building that exists now. So, um, you know, it depends on the municipality. Some of them haven't incorporated those things, but there is statewide code for it at this point, as far as I know. Yeah. Did you answer number two? Uh, I thought I just. Yeah, okay, did. good. 
I was in another, it happens all the time, right? <laughs> you were in another place? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> very common. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask a question and I'm actually going to share my screen. Right in our area, my friend, uh, I'd like to uh, engage you in, um, you know, maybe coming over consulting. We could do a jar test together, a uh, couple of tests, but to create this little ceremonial space in this back garden in, on Mendocino and okay. creating some of these curved benches. This should be a pretty easy design, but these uh, these curved benches around a fire pit area, which could also be rammed earth. So uh, what I'm what I'm getting at here is that are you higher from consulting as well as building? Of course, and this could be this could be an awesome community workshop together. So everybody who's here, get on our mailing list. And actually, I'm gonna the mailing list is under Studio Petrichor, which I'll put it in the um, chat. the chat box for you. You'll want to sign up for the newsletter. That's way that's how you'll know about all these awesome events coming up. And we have awesome articles. We have awesome blogs. So um uh andreas we've got a, a couple projects where we we'd like to reimagine the seating in uh with local materials so um, um how, what's the radius on this this ring oh that's a good question this is conceptual so i can't oh, okay. tell you <laughs> so um, i will um um offer um i have curved formwork already built mm. wow uh, and it's set up for a 13 foot radius all right, well, let's see what happens because we're we're looking yeah. to like get layers in here. So this is conceptual. The construction documents are construction documents are underway. Okay. Um, I, I also um, um, in talking about this to friends, um, I have another person who uh, would like to do some rammed earth in their front yard. So if we're looking at places to do workshops, yeah, it sounds like we have a couple already lined up. I think it'd be Lovely. awesome. Yeah. Um, so I just put the newsletter, I, I just put our website address for Studio Petrichor in the uh, website to, or sorry, in the chat box to sign up for the newsletter. Like I said, you can always unsubscribe, but trust me, hardly anybody does. <laughs> um, so uh, no questions. Uh, well, oh, Tom, 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 there he is. I was waiting for him because, you know, this is the man with the plan. I know he's going to be contacting you at some point. Uh, you're You're muted. We can't hear you. There we go. Hi. Hi. Hey, good to see you again, Andreas. Good um, to see you. Yeah, the uh, Hollywood Hills project with the cages. Did you build the cages yourself, or did you buy those already? No, made? those th those are um, commercial Gabion cages, uh -huh. um, uh, and um, the the supplier that I buy from most often is called Hill Ficker, okay. H-I-L-F-I-K-E-R. Okay. Uh, I believe they're up in Washington state. And they make those, um, those hard edged welded wire cages like you saw, but they also make the softer kind of chicken wire looking cages too. Uh. And, and they also do, you know, much, you know, they're usually used in, in, um, industrial applications you know mountain roads mine sites things like that so yeah but they're great I've, I've never had any issues with their stuff really good are those the similar cages that people have been putting boulders into to make yes yeah. it's the same thing oh cool it's a, it's a gabion and you know again another ancient idea yeah it's just you know using current materials there they'll last for a hundred years or more yeah those are nice okay cool Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, is Joy still on the call? Yeah. Joy, Joy Walters, are you still here? Well, um, she must have signed off. There is an event in, uh, uh, it's Altadena Clean Air Day event, and it's um, somewhere around the, the October 7th. But just so you know, they've asked us to uh, walk, do a walk and talk in the Altadena area uh to talk about clean air um native plants water harvesting the kind of work that we do at studio petrichor and how it all relates to a better environment and um uh there's going to be a walking tour on friday the october the 7th in the morning and uh andreas has agreed to allow us to come by his home so we're going to do that so anyway um and there's craig carpenter has a question Hey, yeah, I got a question. Thanks. Uh, it's been really super interesting. 
But um, I've got a question about, you know, all across the Southwest, Adobe walls around the perimeter of your, your little house yard um, were pretty popular. And, you know, there's, there's places in Tucson or, or parts of the Southwest where it's still done, but is that a solution in your mind for your typical suburban yard fence these days, you know, replacing the, the chain link or, or block walls or, or picket fences everywhere? Like, is there a reason that these can't go? Is there things we can put on the top to shed water and, and keep them, you know, a little bit more stable than maybe they did in the past? But is there anything holding us back on reviving Adobe Adobe um, yard wall? <laughs> well, uh, Adobe is different than Rand Earth in that um, Adobe cannot take, you know, it's, it's going to, because it's not rammed, because it's not compacted, it's just basically, you know, a clay brick that if it gets water on it for any length of time, it's just going to break down really fast. So if you're going to do an Adobe wall, then you're going to have to skin it with uh, stucco or clay or something like that and or put a roof over it. Otherwise, it's going to break down pretty quickly. So um, there is a yard here um, up on, um, is it Calaveras? Um, that there's an adobe wall and an adobe house um, here in Altadena. And you can see um, at edges, you can see the adobe blocks, but then they also um, used an earth plaster on the outside of it to protect it from the weather. Um, rammed earth would be a better wall in, in the sense of longevity and durability. But again, if there's no cement in the wall, then you definitely need some kind of a roof on it um, just to protect it. And then it'll last for hundreds of years. Um, as far as replacing, you know, wood fences and block walls, I, other than, you know, the amount of work it takes to make it and whether or not you want a wall that thick, you know, takes up your uh, precious setback space. Um, that's another question. So I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I was meaning to say having rammed earth replace the, the, the function that and, Adobe walls had. Yeah, yeah, no, you there's, you know, you could do that. It, they would be, I mean, you know, perfectly, perfectly useful for that. Again, it's a look. <laughs> Do you want that look? Yeah. So this seems like I mean it, it, it's it's you know if you set it back just a little bit from your sidewalks and your driveway, you're you're suddenly creating livable space in there that's just being used as a as a buffer from the public. Yep. Definitely. And suddenly, you have private space. So. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of that lawn. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Craig, do you want to sign on and ask your question? Yeah, I was, uh, I'm just impressed that this is, uh, this is, it, it sticks together so well. And I'm just curious about the moisture and, and all these layers appear to be going together at the same time, maybe on the same day even. Uh, or, yeah, ideally. Yeah. And so really it's, uh, there's not much moisture in this mix, is there? I mean, it's- No, it, uh, so the, the basic- Can you describe um, it a little bit? Say that again? Can you just describe how you kind of test for moisture again? Well, the, uh, the ancient test, which we still use is, you take your two hands, you take your mix and you make a ball, but compress it as hard as you can in your hands. And if it holds together and it, you want it to just hold together, then that's good. And then you're gonna drop it from about oh, chest height to the ground and it should shatter back into its constituents. And that's about the level of moisture you need. So it's pretty dry. It's, it's much drier than people think. So it's not, it's not anywhere close to concrete or even Adobe when you're, when, when you're ramming it. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive. <laughs> it is pretty amazing, isn't it? It's really amazing. And, uh, and yeah, if you're um, the ramming process, the, the actual compacting process goes pretty fast. So um, if you had a good crew who knew what they were doing, and, you know, um, and the mixing was going fine, everything was was you know working like clockwork, 
they could do, you know, 20 or 30 yards in a day. They could wow. run. Wow. And so it grows, it goes really fast. So um, that uh, rammed earth amphitheater with um, uh, everybody else, with everybody just figuring it out, um, it took two days to ram that whole thing. Whoa. Wow. Nice. So, you know, it took lo much longer than that to set up the formwork and to do all the other stuff. Oh, okay. Um, but, but the actual ramming process is very fast. Sure. So, and yes, ideally you ram to the height of your wall or structure all at the same, all in the same day, if you can. Um, and if you're going to have a cold seam, you know, if you're going to have a, 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 a finished edge that you're not going to get to, to the next day or whatever, then you need to do like um, that guy in the one uh, image I showed you, create a tooth or um, a keyway or something to lock the two layers together so that, you know, they're not going to move separately from one another. Um, All right, we've got uh, uh, one more question and then we've got to close it down. Uh, Lucia, uh, you pointed out that the adobe wall is built a narrower than a rammed earth wall. What is typically the thinnest rammed earth wall that would work both structurally and aesthetically? Um, so um, I would say, first of all, adobe walls aren't necessarily thinner than rammed earth walls. Um, they could be, but Generally, um, you don't want to go less than 12 inches on the rammed earth if you're doing something in place. And if you're building a bigger structure, like, you know, say you're building a, um, a house or a bigger building, then you're going to go to um, 18 inches all the way up to three feet wide. So they're pretty massive walls. They have um, a lot of thermal mass, and that's part of their appeal, especially in our, you know, hot environments like where we live. Um, so, uh, and the thinnest, well, I guess I would say, you know, getting thinner than a foot is iffy, but the best way to work that out is to do some test blocks and then to stress them out and see how they respond. Um, and it looks like there was, a, um, another question about colorants. Uh, and the way you change the colors is you change the formulation of the soil mix and or you add a colorant, um, iron oxide or something like that, that you can add to the mix. And that's how you get those different layers, different visual food coloring. Layers. What? Not food coloring? No, probably won't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Andreas, once again, oh. Hold on, there's one more message and we're gonna close it. Oh, thank you for this great webinar. Uh, Andreas, uh, I had a feeling this was gonna be awesome and it was awesome. If this oh, well, has thanks. been recorded. We are going to uh, put this on our YouTube channel when I get some time, bear with me, <laughs> probably next time, next week. And um, uh, visit our website for the upcoming events and get on our newsletter. There's lots more coming and definitely stay tuned for the Andreas and Pollyanna Rammed Earth Building event, which is going to come. Coming to a neighborhood near you. Thank and Andreas, you. Andreas, I'm going to be reaching out to you. Let's do something plant nerdy very soon. Okay. Bye, y'all. Bye, everybody. Bye, Have a great you. night. Bye. 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 Bye, Tom. <laughs>